I might come back into the workshop. Now sometimes when I'm scrolling through Instagram or YouTube and I see a really interesting joint or technique, I immediately get out my sketchbook and I draw it because I think I want to try that. And this is a little experiment in that. I came across a really interesting joint. I want to try it out. So, let's roll the intro. This is the joint I came across. It's basically a mortise and tenon, but it's also a keyway. So you make your mortise the width from here to here. And because we cut this little slot out, these cheeks will shrink down as you push it in. When you go out, they should pop back out and lock it in place. And another thing I saw was something rather interesting, a little slanted book storage. And I thought, I could use that in a workshop for sketchbooks and for reference images. So let's just combine all these things and make this. Now, this is going to be a complete experiment. It might work or it mightn't. If this doesn't work, we're going to go with a really fancy wedge mortise and tenon. So, I'm going to start marking out some stuff. See if it works. So, the two cross rails that are going to support the books are at a 15 degree incline. This is to basically hold them in place and stop them falling out, use their own weight against them. So I start out here by using my protractor to score a 15 degree line. I'll then set my bevel squares to that line and make sure that they don't change throughout the process of making this. Uh, this means that with those set and unchanged, even if I'm slightly off at this point, they will still be at the same angle, so everything should end up back at 90 degrees. Now, I have a very handy drawing for all my positions and stuff here, and the final drawing will be available to anyone who wants to try this design or try this jointing method. Uh, just drop me an email, and I'll send it on to you. So here and going forward the pencil lines are only going to be a guide for where i'm going to put my knife line i'm going to do all my marking and transferring with a knife line because accuracy is extremely important for this to work so i'm just laying out here and essentially i'm creating the outline of my two mortises then i will go back over score those with my scalpel blade and transfer around the edges with a little nick and I won't have any shoulders on the side of this so to ensure everything is nice and accurate I'm going to mark all my widths off the actual cross members that are going through and you'll see now I'll just jump forward to when I'm scoring that so I'm marking one at the bottom and then the one further up, although they're at a 15 degree incline, is at 90 degrees to that. That allows the book then to sit in, sitting back on its own weight. And you can see me there just transferring those little nicks at the edge. I'll use my square to bring all those points across and then duplicate the exact same layout on the other side and on the matching piece. And I'll do the same methodology for transferring to the matching piece. I'll lay them out so they're mirrored, book matched the way they're going to be. And then I'll transfer those nicks onto that. Um, make sure to mark your waist. We'll just skip ahead now to starting 
the marching process. Mm. So, that's these marked and perfectly identical. Now we'll cut our mortises. And I decided to do this first because if something goes wrong here, I can always change the shape of this little push in tenon to make sure that everything is right. Whereas if I make the push in tenon and I make the mortise a bit too big, we're in a lot of trouble. So, that's the next step. So, in the interim, it got really freaking cold. So I am now wearing a hoodie. Let's start doing these mortises, shall we? Now it's been a while since I showed the marks on this channel. And I'll just briefly go through my technique again. I like to bore out most of the material with a drill and then clean it up with a chisel. And I pick a drill bit that's roughly 2 mil smaller than whatever my mortise is. That gives me a little bit of leeway going left and right because I go straight through. And then it's really easy just to bulk out that material. The other way, the more traditional way, would be do it all with chisels. I, that's just too much work for me. <laughs> so, let's get down. When cutting mortises, uh, my two main pieces of advice would be one, to come in from both sides, if possible, obviously if you're doing a blind mortise, uh, you can't do that. But the other thing is, don't get too greedy. You want to slowly work your way back to your knife or your pencil line and have that last piece that you cut off only be you know, a hair's breadth possible. Because if you stick your chisel directly in that line and you try to start hammering down, what ends up happening is that the fibers on the flat side of the chisel will compress because the angle of the actual blade is pushing it in and you'll end up with a sloppy mortise. So those are my two tips for cutting mortises. And basically they both boil down to patience. So I'll rough this out coming in from both sides and then it's a return for a fan favorite. And if you want to make your own shoulder jig, there's a link in the corner to how you can do it. It's an amazing tool. Now, as I said, accuracy is very important here because there is no glue. We're just relying upon the fit of the joint. So that's why I'm using my shoulder jig here and I'll clean down all four sides of all the mortises. Normally, I wouldn't bother with the ends because normally if I'm doing a true mortise, it's a wedged mortise. So, you know, it's expanding out into it. So, again, patience here. And you should be able to get a nice, accurate mortise. Like, like really surprisingly accurate. Like, I, I, I went and had a, a cup of tea in celebration. Accurate. Just look at this. I mean, you can't beat that. That's just amazing. And the rest, well, was just drilling and cutting and drilling and cutting three more times until it was all done. And then, well, it's time to start in on our tenons. Hello there. Now, we have four identical holes cut, precisely. These are just a little bit loose. I think that might help with the joint. This time, 
to cut our really fancy locking tenon. And yes, I am absolutely breaking it. There might not be a video this week if this doesn't work. Could be tactical difficulties, which is a euphemism for I got all done. Okay, let's start at that. Oh, in terms of the geometry of this tenon, again, this is why I want to do it. It's so interesting. It's made up of a, a very simple kind of set of components or things that act. So if we look at the image that we have here in the corner, basically the groove down the middle allows the sides to compress, forming a spring. And what I do then is I set my shoulder inside to be the exact width of my mortise. And that's why it's very important when I marked all these, I marked all of these off the cut mortises because although I was able to get some surprisingly accurate results side to side on that one, there is obviously a bit of variation. So with that in mind, everything else expands off that. So I want to make sure my width is right and then I form my little shoulders at the side just simply with a saw and a chisel creating two little mortises shall we say or catching tenons and then we slant down the faces to create a nice ramp and the idea then of these slanted faces is that they pressurize the timber down slowly so it doesn't crack off there's an awful lot of pressure going on here then the circle bit at the bottom is also to stop creating a break point so that when it comes out the other side it pops into place and locks now I may have well you'll see but uh, yeah this is an experiment and it, it's fun and that's why this is not a as an in-depth build video as you normally get from me but uh, yeah Let's see how it all turned out, shall we? Now I fully expect this first one to not work. Well, I guess there's nothing to it but to do it. Mm, that's just denting the surface. Okay. I told you this is an experiment. So I'm going to just peel back here the whole way let's create a ramp let's see if that helps and go in Oh, we're getting places. I mean, that actually worked. It's it's not as as I'd like it to be. I could probably make it that it wasn't, you know, loose. And I think I'll reduce. I have a two mil here of a shoulder. I think I'll cut that shoulder down to a mil. I mean, that's attached with no glue, no wedges, no nothing. That is not coming apart. That is not coming apart. Sugar. Ah, I plan for this. <laughs> the problem, of course, <clears throat> is 
this, this is a one and done. So I had to get all these really right. Really quickly. Okay. To a montage. Okay, so I may have got a bit of finish line fever there and got way ahead of myself in terms of the geometry of how this is going to work. Uh, so yeah, I spent a couple hours here making up test these, test mortises, different thicknesses, different angles, lengths, all that kind of stuff. And what I came up with is this guy here. So this longer flat incline will help us bend the two sides out slowly so they don't crack. And I've made it just slightly wider than the mortise here. So when it pops out, it's pressing against, gives us a nice tight fit. And then I'll just cut the excess off. I'll leave a little bit obviously on the outside for showing when we're done. But unfortunately, we won't know if this works until it's way too late. But that's half the fun. So, I'm not leaving these as square. So, let's shape these and then we can see if I've wasted hours. Now it's time for the world's favorite assembly trick. The super glue and masking tape trick. <coughs> All joking aside, this works really, really well uh, for duplicating parts like I'm doing here. Um, so yeah, I when I'm doing something that's mirrored like this, I like to put on the tape completely across two of them. Then I split them in half. And we just use a paper template here with some uh, glue sticks. Now, people have asked before, uh, do, do glue sticks leave, you know, um, a residue that has to be got off and all that kind of stuff? Is it like double-sided tape? And truthfully, well, no. Um, like, glue, glue sticks are made from potato starch. They are, you know, extremely water-soluble. I find most of the time it just sticks to the paper when I peel it off. Um doesn't really seem to cause an issue but like I said the water is idle so a damp cloth and you're away in a hack it just wipes off and back to what you're working at I recommend them for this kind of stuff nine times out of ten and the shaping of this part proceeds along the normal process so I'll rough it out with my bandsaw and then finalize those curves using my belt sander in my vise now this is a really handy setup and in fact a lot of Bell sanders nowadays come with a fixture that allows you to clamp it down to a table. Um, it, it's really useful for this kind of work. And then the finish is a tip I've shared, oh god, probably a dozen times on this channel. Just a piece of sandpaper around the dowel. It's just so good for working on curves and uneven shapes and getting that really nice sanded finish. Right, so we have our shaped ends. We have our cross members. Now, well, it's, as Alex Ferguson used to say, squeaky bum time. So let's try it. Oh well, glue. Yeah. So like I said, this is a complete experiment and things can go wrong. Obviously that was way too close for the amount of pressure that was going in at that point and it broke. But the advantage that we have is, well it fits. 
I can just shove that in there, glue it in place, and no one will know except you, my lovely viewers. Quick question. What's the definition of insanity? Please don't break. On the plus side, the other long grain example worked perfectly. So that is a lesson learned. Things don't always go right. And that this joint is really, really good going this way. Against long grain, where it's less likely to split. Short grain. But when you come back, I'll be applying something in your soil, and this magically will have worked. So, I was super careful when I glued those pieces back on, and I glued this in place. Because uh, I wanted to see if it had worked, what the rigidity would be like on this. It is. I mean, like, I can't twist it, I can't move it, and to my mind, I, I can't understand. Because like, there's only like a mil, or a mil and a half, on the far side, holding this all together. But, like... I, it's such a cool jointing method. Um, so, yeah, let's do an initial time this baby. Let's just say that it wasn't my night. And that clock you could see in the previous video uh, wasn't broken. It, it was... It, it was ten past one in the morning. And... Yeah. experiment and I suppose the question with any experiment is was it a success or was it a failure well despite the fact that the bottom broke I consider this a success um, it's a really really interesting new method for knockdown furniture I, I, I genuinely cannot wait to apply it in some you know, larger scale furniture products and you know the breakage here on the short grain part of that is because I'm too close here uh, but I, I think I can develop this to work better and to work in those conditions if we just maybe bevel inside of the mortise a bit and increase the shoulder here because it's the tension of the side has been pulled together that's holding it so if we reduce the amount of friction and space here I think we can get a really really strong joint so thank you as always for staying to the end of the video make sure you like share subscribe all that fun stuff and absolutely do try this at home this was so much fun and hey if you found the original video where I saw this that I just sketched in the back of a book, link me to it. Or if you know what this technique is called, 
let me know. Uh, I really want to know more about it. Like I said, this is really rigid. There's only two of them. So yeah, see you all next week.